Thanks, Petrina. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to be here. Lovely to see you as well. This week, I uh, had the pleasure and honour of uh, catching up with, with Tony West for a cup of coffee. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit of something, Tony. Hope you don't mind. I got the nod. It's, all, it's about me. Don't worry. It's not about you. <laughs> now, we're talking about life and um, how sometimes things just don't go where we expect it to go. And I'm sure we can all attest to that somewhere in our life at some point in time. And I was just sharing to, with Tony a little bit about myself and how I was general manager of farm machinery dealership out in Roma uh, for about 11 years, so, you know, being the boss and in charge of 35-odd um, staff, etc. And things didn't work out there for whatever reason. And I ended up being a postman on a postie bike right at the bottom of the food chain. And did I expect to be there? No, I didn't. And um, it was a humbling experience, but God gave me something to learn. First of all, I learned that I was called number five for the first three months because they just couldn't keep posties in Roma because of the dogs and, and the magpies and everything that went with it and the footpaths weren't good. So I was number five for the first three months and after three months, yeah, I was called Miles. So they knew I was hanging around. But the other posties got to know that I was a Christian and I found out that why God placed me there and that was just to be who God wanted me to be in their lives, whether or not it wasn't directly into their lives. But they would say, hey, Miles, before you go today, because I spent a lot of time out on the bike, they knew that I was out there praying and talking to God. Can you talk to JC for me today? My mum's not doing very well. So uh, I do that, and a couple of days later, how did you go, Miles, JC, listen? I said, well, how's your mum going? All right. And I said, yeah, he did. Um, things like that. So it was just uh, absolutely wonderful. But I, I do want to share just something briefly and I know there's a lot of people here that uh, ride motorbikes. I see a few people come in with their helmets this morning. Um, I did learn something when I was on the posty bike, particularly out in Roma, 40 degree heat. They give you beautiful sheepskin seat covers and everything like that. Camelback on the, on the back to, to uh, keep you hydrated the whole time. They did look after us pretty well. But have you ever seen motorcycle riders all of a sudden riding along and they get up on the foot pegs? Yep. It's got nothing to do with stretching legs, okay? This might be new to some of the others, but this is my epiphany anyway. Because on those hot days, things get pretty sweaty down here. And when you stand up and you go on at 60 kilometers an hour and the breeze is flowing through, oh, it's just beautiful. <laughs> so next time you see a, a fellow on a motorbike or someone on a motorbike standing up, it's got nothing to do with stretching the legs. So from now on, it's just changed your perspective of motorcycle riders. So we'll leave it at that. We better get serious, eh? All right. Thank you for a beautiful time of worship this morning and great songs, Petrina. Okay. Three questions this morning for us as we embark on this journey in God's Word this morning. What are you going to learn? So that's your head. What are you going to learn? What is God going to say to you? And what are you going to do today when you leave? So let's pray. Gracious God, we just thank you that we can have a smile and a laugh about doing life. And Father, there, there are times and struggles, and Father, sometimes we don't uh, turn up where we expect at times, but you know the way, and you know why. Help us, Father, to have an open heart and a teachable spirit to lean into you in those times and those moments, and to wait correctly, which we will learn about today, Lord. Father, we just honour you and give you thanks for your word. And thank you for Jesus, who is teaching us again today th through your mighty word in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message today is entitled Cheerful Endurance. And the first thing I want to share with you is a statement. I'll put it up on the screen and you can read it along with me if you like. While we are in these bodies, we are not in the physical presence of the Lord, but the Lord's presence in the person of the Holy Spirit that is within us. And when we are absent from these bodies, whether through death or the much preferred twinkling of an eye thing, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we will be present with the Lord. And until then, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Until then, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. So I'm going to embark a little bit of an introduction before we get into the I am statements today. So in Romans 8, 22 to 25, 
You can turn to it if you wish, but I'll read it to you. Paul talks about our future glory in a particular way. And here we go. This is what Paul says. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? Question mark. For who hopes for what he already sees? But verse 25, throw this up. But if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In other words, once it happens from this passage, there's nothing left to hope for in that sense. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it, it says. And wait for it with what? What word does Paul use up there? Through perseverance. Perseverance. Many translations actually use the word patience instead of perseverance. The Greek word in this context is, I'm going to call it, hoopamone. How's that sound? Sounds all right? That'll do. Which actually means cheerful endurance. How are we doing with that? The joint groaning, we often succeed at very well, don't we? It's the cheerful endurance part that we struggle with. Many people grimace when you talk about having to persevere or have patience. But the truth is that we cannot expect to possess what God has promised without it. Perseverance through patience is the difference between the success and failure of our faith. And I love the way the Passion Translation gathers the words in, chapters, in chapter 10, verses 35 of 36, and I'll share that with you. It says, So don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are destined for a great reward. Then it says, You need the strength of endurance to reveal the poetry, isn't that beautiful, the poetry of God's will, and then you receive what? The promise in full. You know what? I understand why many Christians don't care for the word perseverance or patience for that matter since most people don't want to wait for the manifestation of their faith. I get it. However, if we did not have to wait to get anything, we would not need faith. It is by both faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. Hebrews 6 verse 12 says this, Then you will not become dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their, this is what's said, faith and patience. Hebrews 11.1. I'm sure we can all recall the words in that, from that verse, word for word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If we believed for something and it happened right away, there would be nothing unseen to hope for. Does that make sense? And as such, since God is pleased by faith, we need to, I believe, rethink. This is where we're going this morning. We need to rethink how we view faith's partner, faith and faith. Patience. We need to renew how we think about patience. What is patience in all of this? So I'm going to use an Australian slang word here, and it's called let's have a a chook a look. Who's heard of that? Let's have a chook a look. No? Fiona? No? Maybe it's a mild slang. But anyway, um, we'll go with that. I put two little chooks up there because I couldn't choose one. They were both cute, so I thought I've got to show you both. So let's have a quick chook a look. It's a mild slang I've just found out. Okay, thought it was Australian. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just the Roma Waldron one as well. I heard my dad say it once and that was it. Uh, that was it, righto. Okay, let's have a quick look. Patience or cheerful endurance, and that is how I now 
like to call it, okay? Doesn't just mean waiting. It speaks to actually how we wait. We must wait with a constant attitude of hope and cheerfulness. No matter what we see, we just need to keep waiting and expecting what God has promised. That is why it is through both faith and patience that we inherit, looking toward our future glory with Jesus. Patience is not passive. It is an action word, referring to waiting and persevering with a positive attitude. Waiting itself merely talks of the passage of time, doesn't it? But patience means that we pass that time with hope and anticipation of the fulfilled promise. Cheerfully. As we do life, this, I believe, is just a massive challenge. As we wait, we need to stay in God's word, keeping our faith strong. We need to speak what Jesus has promised and thank him for that, cheerfully enduring all the while. So this morning, let's, let's join some dots, so to speak. Many of us are familiar with our passage today from John 14, where Jesus tells his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this one I call what I call a triple whammy because in the, in the I am statements, a triple whammy in the I am statements, it is I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, Jesus says. But what did that saying or that bunch of words, that sentence really mean for the disciples? And what does it mean for us as we patiently wait, as we persevere, as we do life as a follower of the way. And I shared about the way in the news bulletin today, if you haven't got one, so make sure you have a read. It talks about how the disciples were, were called followers of the way very early on. But as we do life as a follower of the way, what does those words mean for us as we cheerfully endure? Now this conversation in John 14, we read, happens on the last night before the crucifixion, during the Passover meal. Before this, Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, predicted his betrayal by Judas, predicted his denial by Peter, and told the disciples he would soon be going away. That's in John 13. All of this prompted questions about where Jesus was going and why it was that they couldn't follow with him. So Andrew's going to pop up and give us the Bible reading. Turn to John 14, 1 to 10. Come on up, Andrew, and he'll just share with us how the con this conversation goes. So come on up, Andrew. Thanks, mate. Where'd he be? Where's Andrew? Oh, there he is. You're upstairs. Great, Andrew. Run, run. You're young. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. Good on you. Yeah, standing up the back point wasn't the best idea. It's all good. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you also may be. And you know uh, the way to, uh, to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do, uh, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say are to you, do, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Thanks, Andrew. Leave your finger in there or open it up. And, but we're going to pick it up in verse 3. And I'll throw this up on the, uh, on the screen here now. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. As you can see, I've highlighted up on the screen one of, those, one of that particular verses. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. By using this phrase, Jesus is establishing that knowing him is not only the ultimate meaning and fulfilment of life on earth, but the only way to really know the Father in heaven. So let us quickly have a look at each one of these I am statements the morning, this morning. So I want you to put them in your faith toolkit. Who's got a faith toolkit? Some, something in there to help you go through and do life. Our faith, we need some things in there, some foundational stuff just to helpfully, hopefully, cheerfully endure. So we're going to look at the first one in our faith toolkit. It's I am the way, what Jesus said. So as Jesus tells his disciples that he is the way, I believe there are multiple meanings involved here. First off, he addresses our very human instinct to know where we are going before we start a journey. The disciples wanted to know the next step, the next turn, the ultimate destination of where this journey in faith would lead them. And we all want to know that. I mean, True North, they're going through um, unpacking purpose as a Christian. And we all want to know where God's going to lead us and take us. But the disciples wanted to know the next step the ultimate destination of where this journey in faith would lead them. I mean, we ha when we have a long trip ahead of us, what do we do? We want to turn on our GPS and get an idea of how long it will take and the roads we will travel. How are we going to get there? We determine the best, fastest routes, and then what do we do? We start our journey. Thomas was looking for the same kind of information here. However, Jesus makes it clear that they or we won't know the defined way we are supposed to travel in life. We are instead tasked with simply knowing and trusting in Jesus daily and walking in faith that he is the way. When we abide in him, we will not know a defined course, but we can rest in the comfort of faith that he will lead us exactly where we need to go as we walk in him. Did I think I was going to be a postie? No. But in hindsight, I knew that he needed me there. Not only for the people around me, but for my growth. This leads, I believe, to, to a, um, a second meaning. In John 10, 4-9, Jesus compared himself to a good shepherd. I'll just read this to you. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate. And Steve will uh, expand on this further next week. I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. And Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Here in this passage, Jesus, I believe, is comparing himself to a shepherd and us to his sheep. Sheep don't choose their own path to safety and protection, but rely on the shepherd to guide, guard, and care for them. In order to be safe, we have to trust the shepherd and not wander off on our own adventures and try and find our own way. That will lead us to danger and pain. But when we follow Jesus, he leads us to exactly where we need to be. And finally, Jesus is making clear from this passage that he is the way to the Father and by extension to heaven, which I mentioned earlier, our future glory. He says that he goes to prepare a place for us in John 14, as Andrew just read. And this suggests that after we have completed the journey of this life, 
we will find ourselves in a place of rest where the Father is. Does that slide make sense to you this morning? I hope so. The second one for yours and my faith toolkit is I am the truth. Good question, isn't it? What is truth? And how can we know truth? Just take you back to a particular time. After Jesus had been arrested, he found himself standing before Pontius Pilate and the Roman governor of Judea. Jesus had been accused of blasphemy, of stirring up the people to revolution, and it was rumoured he called himself a king. In speaking to Jesus, Pilate found no evidence of any crime worthy of death, but was fascinated by his talk of a kingdom that was not of this world. We read in John 18, verse 36, Then Jesus answered, I am not an earthly king, he says. If I were, my followers would have fought when I was arrested by the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pushing back on the idea of whether this lowly carpenter from Galilee truly considered himself to be some kind of king, Jesus re- continues to talk to, to Pontius Pilate in verse 37. He says, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate's response to this then comes in the form of a question. The same question that humanity has been asking for centuries. The same response to Jesus that keeps so many from faith. Pilate said to him, what is truth? We find this answer in our reading today. This question answered in John 14, when the disciples were there with him. Jesus tells them, I am the truth. Jesus can testify to the truth and teach the truth because he himself is that truth. Because in him there is nothing false, nothing misleading, and nothing fake, or uncertain. Now this morning, did you know that each of us are capable of knowing truth? But none of us can claim to actually be truth. There are too many things we don't know, too many things we get wrong throughout our lives. But Jesus claims to be truth, and in doing so, he claims to be one with God. That fact is confirmed and set from John 1, verse 1. It's a fact. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That set the stage for this fact that Jesus is the truth. In this one sentence, John is proclaiming Jesus as the word, which would have suggested to everyone that Jesus is the beginning and the culmination of all that has been true throughout eternity. And that to seek the truth ultimately leads us to seek Jesus. So when we seek to figure out what is the truth and what is a lie, we can measure it against the words of Jesus who himself is the truth. That is why the Bible is often called the book of truth. Let's move on. Faith toolkit number three. Whack this one in there. I am the life. This I am also draws us back to the shepherd analogy, I believe, of John 10. And again, Steve will unpack this over the next couple of weeks. John 10 a verse we often um, remember and refer to. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Then it goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. 
Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Here we have Jesus is, is not only painting a picture of how he defends and leads his sheep, but also foreshadows his death on the cross when he says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. But if this is true, why do Christians still struggle in life? Why do we still endure pain and heartache? Here we go. You ready for this? Because this life is not the point. This life is not our ultimate goal and does not encompass the eternity of who we are, future glory. This life is a mere drop in the ocean of eternity and serves as the starting block on the marathon that leads us to our goal of eternal life. We can slow it down. We can spend time, money and energy working to fight against it, but we can't stop it from marching forward. Jesus, I believe in these I am statements, is teaching us that what we are to really be concerned with is not this life, but with eternal life. The scriptures speak often of the life to come after our life on this earth as we follow the voice of our shepherd. We can grasp what that eternal life is in the here and now. We can live this life in such a way that we are not chasing things that don't last, but chasing the things that do last and have eternal significance. This type of life has eternal impact, not only for us, but for untold others around us. When Jesus refers to himself as the way, the truth, and the life, he's giving us a better way to live our lives through him. He is showing us that through following him daily in faith, he will lead us to a better, richer, more meaningful life than we could ever find on our own. And how do we do this? With cheerful endurance. Because by faith, we know. We just know. And this brings me to one last point this morning as we finish up. One last point regarding our faith and our triple whammy this morning. It's a long one. I'll put it up on the screen. It's a long one. Kind of a tongue twister. But it has to be said like this, how I put it, and it has to be said in this order. And it says this. This is what I want you to take with you today as well. The Bible's proven perfect prophetic track record is why we can cheerfully endure. Amen? Let us say it together, eh? One, two, three. The Bible's proven perfect prophetic track record is why we can cheerfully endure. So in closing this morning, I hope you have just bolstered your faith toolkit. And as we sit here today, and as we go into this week, I can guarantee that every person here this morning, including me, is currently waiting on something. No matter where we are in life, if we are breathing, we are waiting on something. If we are serious about receiving what God has for us, we must wait joyfully and cheerfully knowing and expecting the outcome that God has promised. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And when we have these tools, these I am's embedded in our hearts, in the foundations of our faith, we can know and believe that the promises are fulfilled in Jesus. There is a proven track and therefore the manifestation is just a matter of time. So my advice today is relax, exercise patience, exercise perseverance, and expect the promise to arrive at the right time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we 
come before you and so thankful for the words of Jesus. That he is the truth, he is the life, and he is the way. Father, we thank you for the word that we can read each and every day. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, you being in person in us now. And we look forward to that future glory where we can be face to face with you. But in the meantime, Father, as we do life, as we share your love to those around about us, following the way in Jesus, that you'll embolden us with our faith. Draw from our faith toolkit to share your love with those around about us, to share the gospel, the good news, so that others may join into that future glory. Father, as we do do life, and um, sometimes there's things we don't expect, but help us, Lord, to, to endure well, to see your hand. It's so easy, Lord, to see it in hindsight. But in the moments, Father, I just pray that you'll give us the courage and the strength to draw on your son, Jesus, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.